see, in 1967, while I was trying to take my first vacation, my mother killed herself. And since then, I've written a book about it. And just to clear up any questions you may have about the title of this monologue, this is the box. And this is the monster in it. It's a book I've been working on for the past four years entitled Impossible Vacation, due to be published by Knopf in hardcover two years ago. Uh, it's 1,900 pages long and I think is just about finished. In the book, I call my character Brewster North. Like me, he's a Puritan who can't take a vacation. As soon as I signed the contract for the book, I decided that's all I wanted to do, was just write. I wanted to give up the monologues and start writing. I thought the monologues were making me too, too extroverted, perhaps even causing me to pander. And I thought what I wanted to do was really just go away to a writer's colony and just write. No living, just writing. And I applied to a number of writers' colonies and got accepted at one of the best, the McDowell Colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire, where many great writers have gone, including Thornton Wilder, who wrote that great American classic, Our Town, about love and death in a small New England town. And he wrote it up there at the McDowell Colony and modeled the town of Grover's Corners in the play after Peterborough, New Hampshire, where the colony is. And I arrived there, and it was a perfect situation. It could not have been better. It was ex 600 acres of forest, 52 individual little cabins or studios. So I had my own little house, and I, I was told that I could do anything in it I wanted, which was quite something for me, having come from New England and to return to New England and be in a house where I could do anything I wanted. It was a steamy treat, I have to tell you. I was a bit paralyzed by it. Now, no one can bother you in your little house. Uh, you ha can't have any visitors unless they're invited. There's no telephone. You receive all your messages up at the main house. Uh, you eat your main meals up at the big house. And then, but in the day, they bring you your lunch in a little basket and tiptoe up and leave it on the back steps and tiptoe away like Yogi Bear into the forest and leave you completely alone. It was wonderful. The only problem with my house happened to be the name. The name of my house happened to be the Bates House. <laughs> Named after Nurse Bates, who nursed McDowell in his final stages of syphilis. So needless to say, I was doing all sorts of exorcisms before I could get down to the writing. And then I got down to the writing, and I began to write, and I found it was horrible. It's disgusting. Writing is like a disease. I don't know why I'd ever romanticized it. It's, it steals your body from you. There is no audience. You were completely alone. My, my, my knuckle was swelling up. I had an arthritic knuckle. I was writing longhand from the pen pressing against my knuckle. I was losing my sight in my left eye. I was going blind in my left eye, which was very upsetting for me because here I was trying to work on all my Oedipal themes. And I thought, oh, no. You know, there goes the first eye. So what do you do after you write for three hours? You're writing longhand. You write and you write maybe four hours at the most. Your hand is like this. And then what can you do? You can't write anymore, so you go for a walk in the woods. And I walk and I walk and I walk and I walk. And I go back to the main house and I drink and I drink and I eat. And I reread what I wrote and I get up in the morning and I write. And I walk and I what? And I write and I walk and I drink. And I drink and I drink and I, and I reread what I wrote. And I write and I walk and I drink. And I drink and I drink and I drink. And I walk and I drink and I drink and I drink. And I just wanted to get out of there. I wanted to get out of there, but how could I leave? I was in a privileged place. <laughs> Something larger than me had to draw me away, you know, like someone had to have a heart attack. Who would it be? <laughs> at last, what gets me out of there is that I get a message up at the main house from the Mark Taper Form Theater in Los Angeles. Around the time that I did the contract for the book, I also did a deal with the Mark Taper Form Theater. I never thought it would come through. They were going to apply to the National Endowment for the Arts uh, this is back in the old days when they were doing wild and crazy things like that. <laughs> they were going to apply to get a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to have me in residence in Los Angeles for a, for a whole year. And I was just to ride the buses of Los Angeles, just hang out and ride the buses of L.A. and find and meet interesting people that, that I could bring in an interview on stage. 
about living in Los Angeles. The only criterion being that these people in no way could be involved in the film industry, right? <laughs> the project was to be called L.A. The Other. So they call me up at the mock tape perform and say the grant has come through and I must come out. I think, great, what a great excuse. I'll take the monster with me, I'll work on it in the morning, look for L.A. The Other in the afternoon. So they relocate Renee and I out there in a, a little bungalow in the Hollywood Hills, and it's wonderful. I wake up and discover something I never knew I was missing because I've never had it before. A view! My God, no wonder my gears are grinding my head. In New York City, I look out at a tar paper roof in another building. In the McDowell Colony, I looked out at a bush. But to wake up in Los Angeles and look out our bedroom window, and there, 20 miles in the distance, a snow-capped mountain, Mount Baldy, when you could see it, the seven clear days of the year. And there, the sun would be coming over Mount Baldy, waking us up to the smell of flowers and the sound of birds and wind chimes. And I'd leap up and go over to my writer's desk and open my monster and begin working on it, and I'd feel the sun come across my writer's hand and relax it. And I'd get up and follow the sun around into the living room and then have a cup of coffee, watch the sun come through the palm trees, have another cup of coffee, watch the sun come through the cypress trees, follow the sun around into the dining room, watch the sun come through the dining room window, have a martini, watch the sun go down over Sunset Strip, have another martini. Why go out? Why bother? Why work on a book? <laughs> the only thing to get me out of this, my assistant, K.O., hired by the Mark Taper form to take me around looking for L.A. the other. She'd pull up in her fastback red Ford, Southern California freckled gal, take me out looking. I had no idea how difficult it would be to find people not involved in the film industry until I got out there. And I saw a TV special in which they were interviewing people as they came out of the shop right with their groceries and they were running up and saying, hi, good morning, tell us, how's your film script going? And everyone went, what? How did you know? <laughs> right up to the cashier. So, uh, what are we doing? I don't know. Where, where, where to tell my assistant to go looking for L.A. the other? I, I have no idea. I mean, where do you aim her? There's no there there. I don't know what to do. We're driving to uh, senior citizen centers, uh, golden age drop-in centers. We drive over to high schools to talk to the students. We're driving down to Long Beach to look for Cambodian refugees. We're driving over to Venice Beach to talk to homeless living in lean-tos. We're driving downtown L.A. I'm looking down the side streets. Nothing. No one. Nothing. No one. Nothing. No, oh, wait. K.O., slow down. Slow down. I just saw some people living in a refrigerator carton over there. She goes, nothing going on down there, dude. I said, K.O., I know I saw something going on down there. You've got to slow down. You know, in fact, why don't you just pull over and park and we'll walk back and hang out. Have you ever done that before? Just park and walk? That was the day I realized that my assistant, K.O., had what I would call a 35-mile-an-hour consciousness. <laughs> Nothing under 35 miles an hour registers on her retinas. I mean, she has been in motion since the day she was born. She started with the baby carriage, went to the roller skates, went to the skateboard, now she's in the car and she's headed for the wheelchair. You know, no one walks in Los Angeles. It's an old story, but I'll tell it again. No one walks in Los Angeles. <laughs> So I'm up, and I'm working on the monster. I'm able to work on it in the morning, and I'm right up to here, where the character, the character is, it's the summer of 1966, and he's at home with his mother, trying to help her through a very severe nervous breakdown. He wants to help her through it, but at the same time, he wants to leave home, because he knows if he doesn't get out, he'll never have a life of his own. And he wants to have a life of his own, and he wants to become an actor. And he wants to get his actor's equity card at the Alley Theater in Houston, Texas. He wants to go down there because it has a very good reputation in the theater. But that season, they're doing Chekhov's play, The Seagull. And he is sure that he is absolutely right for the role of Konstantin Gorilovich, the young writer. Perfect for it. He's sure that he's perfect because he, he, he's sensitive like Konstantin. And he also has a relationship to his mother, not unlike Konstantin has to his mother. And the other thing that he likes about the role is that Konstantin gets to shoot himself in the head at the end of every play uh, night and then come back the following night to play himself again. And Brewster likes this concept. Now, he gets down to the LA theater with great expectations, sure that he's going to be cast in the role. He gets down there and finds the director is cast someone else in the role that is totally wrong for it. Is not sensitive, does not have a mother, but has tenure. Right? 
So Bruce is furious about this. But being a New Englander, he's unable to express his anger. So, instead he tries to purge his anger by purifying himself by eating a strict soybean diet. <laughs> Soybeans morning, noon, and night. And these soybeans are causing enormous intestinal gas. Wherever he walks in that theater, he is leaving those silent but deadly slow hot burners, right? But he doesn't sit down. He's not taking responsibility for them. He just keeps moving and wafting and moving and wafting and moving and wafting. You see, he's not learned how to express his anger through the proper orifice yet. Now, the director of the theater senses something's wrong, right? So she decides to give him a better role in the next play, The World of Sholom Alekheim, which is about this play, about this, this play about this little guy, Bunch of Schwag, who has such a difficult time on earth. He's so humble, he has such a rough time that when he goes to heaven, the angels bring him prizes and rewards, and Brewster gets to play the lead angel. And every night he's dressed in white angel robe with four other angels behind him in the wings waiting to go on. The angel robe going all the way down to the floor, held down with lead weights, because it's 1966, so he's not wearing any underwear on under the robe. And for 15 minutes he stands there, and for 15 minutes this angel robe acts as a perfect natural gas tent. Fifteen minutes worth of slow hot burners build up under the robes till he, he makes an entrance like a combination of Cardinal Fulton, Bishop J. Sheen and Life is Worth Living and Loretta the beginning of the television show. The other angels are weeping behind him. I'm on a toot, I'm on a roll. As I write. Get up, I never forget that morning, I get up, I come to write, and it's so hot, I can't write, it's still hot. There's not a sound. Renee's asleep, naked, under the, be under the bed sheet, and I'm sitting at my table in my underwear, and I can't even concentrate because of the silence and the heat. Not even, not even the sound of birds or wind chimes. And I'm sitting there, and I hear this. What's that? Thunder? Thunder in Los Angeles? I think, no, no, they're, they're filming a western down in the canyon. That must be what it is. Then all of a sudden, something happens I'm completely unprepared for. It's as though they're testing a hydrogen bomb in Los Alamos, and the shock waves are coming across the desert. You don't see them coming, but when they hit the house, you feel it, and the entire house goes. Renee sits up naked in bed and yells, Fall, it's the earthquake. Run for the door jam. Somewhere, Renee is red. You're supposed to stand in the door jam during an earthquake, and she's got the discipline to do it. I'm running for the front yard. I'm in my underwear. The entire floor turns to jello under my feet. There's no substance. I get to the front door, and there's Renee jammed naked in the jam. She's jammed in the jam. I'm trying to get under her. I'm trying to get out. I slip out, and boom, I'm out on the front lawn. And there are all my neighbors at last in their underwear going, Hi-ho, good morning. You survived the earthquake. Welcome to California. Welcome aboard. Then the entire neighborhood is buzzing with conversation. All the neighbors are out talking about the earthquake and the earthquake. Where were you during the earthquake? Oh, you're kidding. He did? Oh, no. How long's it been? And he thought he caused it? Oh, lover, man. You got a real stud there, Marge. Oh, look out. Look out. You slept at that third. That's the third one you slept through. The third one you slept through. Oh, no. You can't show those little statues. You can't show them. You got to go up and buy the distilled water and the tuna fish and look out for the big one. The big one. Look out for the big one. The big one. The big one. Then everyone stopped talking about the earthquake and went back to talking about their film scripts. <laughs> Just after the earthquake hit, our film, Swimming to Cambodia, came out. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's an 87-minute film of a raving talking head, mine, talking for 87 minutes about uh, some experiences I had while playing a small role in the film The Killing Fields. Now, we were very proud of the film, uh, but we had no idea it would be that popular, particularly in Los Angeles. I was so surprised. And many producers found out that I was out there working on my book. They found out through my agent, and they began calling my agent because they, they wanted to take me out to lunch to find out if I had an idea. <laughs> there are so few of them going around out there that you can get paid sixty or seventy thousand dollars if you come up with one at lunch. And I said, Renee, I've got to do this. I'll get up and work on the monster earlier in the morning. I really want to take these idea lunches. Um, 
I figured, you know, if you drink enough and start talking, something's bound to come up, you know? <laughs> so I, I was going to, I was putting on 20 pounds with these platinum card lunches, and uh, which would start with uh, basically, oh, for the Bloody Mary with the celery, the healthy way to drink, and <laughs> go on to the um, sun-dried tomatoes in the arugula, marsh, radigio, hot goat cheese salad. <laughs> and then... Um, the poached baby salmon and the peony veggies and the chardonnay and the fumé and the sauvignon blanc and then the passion fruit mango mousse. <laughs> and then it's time to talk ideas. The next people to take me out and court me uh, after the producers were, was the agency CAA. Now, if you don't know what CAA is, it, it, it's the largest talent agency um, in the universe, I think it's safe to say. I mean, they are so big, they, they, they control the American economy. <clears throat> I mean, they, they, they put together packages. Uh, they, look, I would rather not be talking about them this evening. Um, but, but I'm going to because it's part of the monologue. But uh, if they ever found out I was talking about them, I would never work in Hollywood again. And I want to work in Hollywood again because of the health insurance. <laughs> if you do three weeks' work in a feature film, you get a year's worth of major medical, dental, and psychiatric. <laughs> There's no way I was going to look that gift toss in any part of its anatomy. When I say, they're like a big club, and they control all the talent and, and the producers, and they've got all the talent. They've got them all. They've got Jack. They've got Eddie. They've got Dustin. They've got Whoopi. They've got Arnold. They've got Goldie. They've got Sylvester. They, they've got them all. And I thought, if they were to get me, that might give me a chance at last to, to have the power to call a good role, to, to, to do a good role. Uh, to do something noble, forthright, upstanding, sincere. I mean, I really, I saw myself as, as kind of as Jimmy Stewart in a remake of It's a Wonderful Life, or, or uh, Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird, or, or, or maybe a new project, Mr. Spalding Goes to Washington. But, but something heartfelt, sincere, and at last I would get rid of this New York self-deprecating, ironic voice and, and, and speak from my heart, you know, all-American father of four kind of thing. And uh, I came in with my head held high into this CAA meeting, uh, sincerely in, and I walk in, and they are there, and there they are, about uh, 10 or 15 of the men and women, and they are all suntan, wind-blown, healthy. Oh, there are no more drugs in Hollywood. Health is the new drug in Hollywood, and I mean health with a capital H. These people have been up since 5 in the morning doing kung fu, jogging, reading scripts, eating blue-green algae from the bottom of the Oregon lakes, and you walk into that room, and they are there, and they are ready. <laughs> I have never walked into a room and felt such a sense of readiness in my life. There was nothing happening there, but they were ready for it in case it did. And I walk in and the head guy gives me, well, the, actually the only drug left in Hollywood, a can of Diet Coke. And then uh, he leans into me and says, uh, uh, thank you very much, Spalding, for coming and taking time from your busy schedule uh, to come in and talk with us. We'd like to begin by telling you that we all hope you're not one of those artists that's afraid to make money. No, uh, I, I, I don't think so. How, how much money are we talking about here? Well, we did the $17 million Stallone deal. $17 million? Dollars? All, 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 all for Sylvester? That's right. I didn't know whether to say congratulations or you should be shot at sunrise. Uh, I, I mean, I was conflicted. I just hoped Sylvester had good charities he was giving to. And I think that if you sign with us today, we can start you off tomorrow as an assistant to a Ghostbuster. Oh, well, thank you. It's not exactly what I was fantasizing about, but I, what I really want to ask is, uh, why am I in here? How did you find out about me? Well, we saw your film, Swimming to Cambodia, and I never thought I could watch anyone talk for 87 minutes, let alone another man. Uh, well, uh, what, what movie theater did you see it in? I didn't see it in the theater. We saw it here in the office on tape. But it's not out on video yet. We have our ways. I said, well, you could do me a favor, uh, because my father, uh, my father didn't get to see it because when it played at his hometown, it was in an art cinema, and, and they didn't have any matinees, and he wouldn't miss cocktail hour. So, uh, the boss man, the head man, just reaches over like this and takes what looks like a piece of plastic tubing from a tropical fish tank and pulls it from the wall. 
get Spalding Gray's father a copy of Swimming to Cambodia, will you please? I'm going back now to summer of 1964. I realized it was the time the character was first trying to get away from his mother. He had been dating her a lot that winter, and going to the movies and seeing all the latest Bergman films because his father wouldn't go out to the movies with his mother. And so winter leads to summer, and he stays home and begins swimming with his mother in Narragansett Bay. And then they lie in the sun and discuss things like Christian science versus existentialism, which is uh, better. And, um, but he really wants to get away. He really wants to escape and go down to Provincetown in Cape Cod because that is the summer, summer of 64, the first time in American history when people are just learning how to hang out. Someone had uh, read about it and now they were doing it. They would just lean against a building all summer, staring out to sea, you know, without, without any uh, guilt or, 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 or thoughts in their head, uh, like tan vegetables. And Brewster desperately wants to get down there and learn how to hang out. And he wants to borrow his mother's car and he talks her into it. So he loads up the car in the morning with all the provisions, her Metrical and instant breakfast, his father's frozen meat and steak, his L.L. Bean sleeping bag, says, Bye, Mom! Drives off down the road, gets about five miles down the road, turns around, comes back, unloads everything, goes swimming with his mother. Next morning, loads up the car again with all the provisions, says, Bye, Mom! Drives about 10 miles down the road this time, turns around, comes back, unloads everything, and he does not make it to Provincetown that summer. Now, I'm working on that section on the book, and I get a call on the telephone. Someone has an idea. They interrupt me with an idea. I like it this time that they have the idea, and I like the idea. They want to sell this idea to Columbia Pictures and send Renee and I to Nicaragua to research a film script idea. The idea being this, that, that we would hitch up with a bunch of American fact finders, groups that were going down then to check on the American illegal war with the Contras against the Nicaraguans. And they were going to go down and check. Many of these fact finding groups were going down then. I think it was uh, Nicaragua's major economy at the time, American fact finding groups to go down and check on the war. So we would just sign up with them and use them as a study. The idea of the script was that the bus, finally, coming to pick us up in Nicaragua to take us to the airport, doesn't show up. And suddenly we are trapped down there after giving away all of our belongings to the Nicaraguans, and we are now equal to them. We have been observing them, now we're with them. And this has a very nice dark twist to it that I like very much. And I think, yes, why not? I mean, I certainly wanted to go to Nicaragua, or certainly on my list. I mean, I would much rather be going to Nicaragua than not be able to write about not being able to go to Provincetown. Right? So I said to Renee, yes, I'll put the monster aside for just a little bit. We must do this trip. It's an excellent idea. And we sign up with 36 fact-finding American group. Earnest, earnest. Oh, I felt like trash. <laughs> I mean, I felt like a spy in a house of love, you know. But I knew the plane wouldn't crash because they were so earnest and dedicated. They were, I mean, uh, the, the Sandinistas referred to them, perhaps behind their backs, I don't know, is Sandalistas because of the Birkenstock sandals that they all wore. <laughs> earnest, dedicated doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh, 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 a dentist. Uh, and we get down there and we arrive and we're staying in this little ranch house that, uh, well, before the revolution, it belonged to a person and now it was the people's. And we arrive and come in, and uh, I remember as, as we came in, there was a, a radio playing Nicaraguan music and a, a chain with a padlock around the refrigerator and a television set, mostly snow, but when it was on, playing I Love Lucy uh, reruns and, and little Nicaraguan kids running in, loving American culture, wishing that we could trade with them, not understanding why. And, uh, and it's divided into dormitory style, the house. The women were down one end. Renee was down there with the women. I was up with the men. I was in with the three roommates, a born-again Christian from Toronto, a social worker from Ventura, California, and a pedantics major from Berkeley. That's the first I'd heard of that one. Now, I really wanted to get to know everybody, but the, uh, the born-again Christian and, and the social worker said it, th they didn't want to talk about their personal past. It was not revolutionary. Uh, but uh, Daniel, the pedantics major, would talk, but I couldn't understand him. He mumbled. He, he, he mumbled, he chain-smoked, he, he was green. Something was wrong with Daniel. And at last, we were taken up to a hill station in Malta Galpa. And uh, we were taken out of our house and up there. We didn't know what facts we were going to be exposed to uh, that particular morning. But uh, it was a little frightening because the meal that we were given at lunch was kind of like something they give you just before they take you to the electric chair. Um, up until then, we'd been eating rice and beans. 
Now suddenly we're eating steak, rice, and beans, and Nicaraguan beer, which is wonderful, and we're the only ones in the restaurant, and there's 36 of us all gobbling it down, the, the, everyone's chomping down their meat. The only person not eating is my, my roommate, Daniel, the pedantics major. He is sitting there, he's wired. He's got, whew, wired. Not, I'm taking little uh, pieces of his steak, you know, I, I know I shouldn't have been, uh, in, sips of his beer, I shouldn't have been in that heat. It was, it was 110 degrees, but it was a dry heat, a dry heat. And, we get up to this house, this shed, after lunch, and it has a, a, a tin roof and a dirt floor, and uh, we are told that we're going to be exposed to the mothers of the heroes and the martyrs. And um, there's about to 25 of them, and I have to describe this as something like a combination of an AA meeting and a very perverse performance art piece. These mothers have been coming down to testify every time a fact-finding group comes through, so they have spoken their stories many times. In my opinion, they don't have to tell them anymore. The aura of grief that's around these women as they come in is so dark, is so... I had never witnessed anything like that. I think we could have just sat there and meditated for 10 minutes in silence on that aura of grief, and they could have left. And they told us... Contras push their husbands out of helicopters. This 13-year-old in so many pieces, she couldn't find all the pieces. She tried to pick them up. Another the metal rod driven through one ear and out the other. And then they said to us, please, please go tell your President Reagan to stop these horrors. Would they have some naive concept of our democracy that we have some sort of direct line to our elected officials? I mean, they could approach Daniel Ortega at the time. He was, he was accessible. He lived around the corner from, uh, from us in a ranch house. And I am sitting there, and it is so hot because there's a tin roof. And I can barely stay awake because I'm feeling so guilty for being down there for Columbia Pictures. And, and, and I, 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 I should never have eaten that meat and had that beer. It is every, you know, I could barely stay awake. And I'm trying to picture myself getting a haircut and putting on a Palm Beach suit, climbing up the steps of the White House to tell President Reagan to stop these horrors. And I can't stay awake. And I look around and I see everyone else in the whole group is nodding out. They all have the tape recorders going, so they're getting every bit of it. The only person in our group that is wide awake is Daniel, my pedantics roommate. He is over there across the room from me, and he is wired. Woo! He is listening. He's got green sparks coming out of his eyes. I have never seen... I mean, I stay awake by watching him listen. And then after the testimony, the mothers file out and leave the room, and Daniel, my roommate, gets up and comes across the dirt floor as though we're magnetized right over to me and says, Come here. Come over here a minute, will you please? Listen, was I... Was I... Was I, was I just put on trial to stand for being a, a counter-revolutionary? What? Um, Daniel, I don't think they mentioned your name once, really, in the testimony. No, no, I want to know the truth. I, are you here to help me or to report on me? I said, is this man reading my mind? Uh, does he know I'm a spy for Columbia Pictures? I don't know what you're talking about, Daniel. CIA is what I'm talking about. CIA and they're here. Are you one? Why do these people choose me, I wonder? Out of all the people in the group, why did he come across to me? This happens often. I don't know what you're talking about, Daniel. CIA, I couldn't be in them, really. I, I wouldn't know how to be in the CIA. I don't know how to make things up, you know? If I could make things up, I'd finish my book. Uh, but uh, really, no, they're here. They're here. Uh, what do you mean? No, they, they, they're speaking through my teeth. The, the, the CIA, the, the, they got me. They're spraying my food. They're trying to get my passport. Don't, don't you understand? That's why I haven't been eating. They're following us. I said, just a minute. Group leader, group leader, could you come in here a minute, please? I, I have to ask you something. We have a little problem. No, don't, don't bring her in. No, she, she's, she's the leader. She's, she's one of them. She's on the top. She sprayed me up and down. She's got the, whoo, she got, whoop, he, what, whoop. He flips out. He completely flips out. He begins tearing at his hair, tearing his hair from the back of his head. The entire group has to come in and gather around him like a great donut, like a life preserver to keep him from being put in a Nicaraguan insane asylum. And there he is in the middle of us, like this great donut, raving, tearing his hair as we move back to the house, keeping him in the middle. We divide up in groups to take care of him, you see? And people are, like, force-feeding him, thinking it's hypoglycemia. Like Common and turns to get, take care of him. I'm amazed to find that I'm the people in the whole group to deal with it. Amazed because up until Nicaragua, because of the guilt that I felt for my mom, I'd been seriously considering giving up shelter in order to become a psychiatric social worker. 
this man cured me of that fantasy. If nothing else happened to me in Nicaragua, he cured me of that fantasy. I mean, I was the least able to deal with him. I would get with him, and I, 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 I mean, I think it was a boundary problem, actually. I have very weak boundaries, and I, I have to tell you, I think his insanity was leaking into mine. I would be so impatient. I was like, no, Daniel, no, 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 stop it. No, no, you eat your food. You eat. No, no, all right, now you stop. Now there's no, no, there's no CIA in our group. There is no CIA. I, 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 I don't think, you know, I'm not gonna... No, 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 Dan, dude, stop, shut up. No, you're crazy. Ooh. <laughs> Finally, we did have a psychiatric social worker in our group, and she took him aside and said, Daniel, what was it you were taking in the United States that you did not bring with you here? <laughs> we barely got him out of the country. We had to help him through passport control. Going through passport control, he tried to eat his passport. It would have been the only thing he'd eaten while he was in Nicaragua. We get back to the L.A. airport. At LAX, a stretch limo shows up for him. I hope his mother's in it. I hope they're taking for him for a long rest. I don't stick around to find out. I'm back at the house, pacing around the table, saying, Renee, Renee, what are we going to do? Listen, what are we going to do? Columbia Pictures has paid us to write this film script, and I didn't see anything of Nicaragua. I couldn't tell you what Nicaragua looked like. All I saw was the inside of one psychotic, pedantic American's mind. What are we going to write? Renee says, we'll make something up. I said, make something up? I don't know how to make things up. I would finish my book if I could make things up. Don't you understand? We went down there to use these people as a study. She said, well, I'm going to make something up. You know, it, you, you go do what you have to do. So I rush in to look at my monster to see if I've got any distance on it. And I open it there on my writing desk. And I am sitting there. And I'm telling you, in my undershirt, sleeveless undershirt, it's, it, the sun is pouring across my desk. I can't think straight. It's 92 degrees in Los Angeles in November. And I'm thinking, when is this sunshine going to end? You know, when will my body be covered in wool and corduroy again so I can think again? And next to me is the answering machine. There it is. It's on overblink. All these messages are piled up. Everyone wants a piece of me because we're swimming to Cambodia. And it's wow, 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 wow. It's on overblink, I think. I'll just put the monster aside and take the messages off the machine. First message to come off the machine is from HBO. Home box office wants to do a new HBO special of me traveling around the United States interviewing people who have just been taken aboard flying saucers. No, 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 I, 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 I don't feel insulted at all. No. I'm, sh I'm sure they're out there. Yes. No, 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 I'll be down in the morning to discuss the details with you. I hang up. The next message to come off the machine is from an independent filmmaker from India. Now, he's had an epiphany. He's seen the poster of Swimming to Cambodia, and he's had an epiphany. If you haven't seen the poster, it's a picture of my head with a very distressed expression, and the water line is right here, and I'm either coming up, surfacing from the water, or going down for the last time, depending on how you look at it. Here's how this Indian, independent Indian filmmaker looked at it. He wanted to bring me to India to the Kumbha Mela, which is a religious festival that happens every seven years. And everyone goes to where the three holy rivers come together, the Jamal, the Saraswati, and the Ganges. And they come together in this great maelstrom. And, and, and two million people go down there and sit on the edge of it and begin throwing themselves in. Those that are holy pop up like corks. Those that aren't, whoop, under and drown. And he wants to take me there, throw me in, and film my reaction. This is the only telephone call that Renee intercedes from the other room, calling out, Spall, do not return that phone call. And I am out there pacing around the table, and my assistant's outside, and LA, I'll be right out, KO, I'll be right out, LA the other. We got to, and I gotta get to Washington, uh, to DC, to talk to President Reagan, to stop, st stop, the, stop the war, the mothers of the heroes, and the martyrs, and the book, and the characters in Provincetown, and I gotta get it back, and, 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 and Thanksgiving's coming, Thanksgiving's coming, Thanksgiving's coming. And, 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 and Renee's saying, Paul, please, please, can't we go home for Thanksgiving? I won't recognize it out here. I wanna see my friend. So, so all right, Renee, all right. One last interruption. I'll put everything aside. We get an uh, inexpensive uh, five-day excursion ticket to go to New York City for Thanksgiving. The morning that we were supposed to fly, uh, Renee's in bed, uh, sleeping late. I'm up brushing my teeth. And I hear Renee from the bedroom call out saying, Spall, Spall, hey, look, I, come here. I, I got a huge spider bite on my thigh. What, a spider bite? Oh, no, on a day we're supposed to travel? Hey, what would a spider be doing in bed, bed with you in November? Oh, my God, you're, you're right. Whatever it is, just, here, put some calamine lotion on it. It should dry it up. We get back to New York City. 
Thanksgiving Day comes, Renee spends the entire day lifting her skirt, showing her friends this bite on her thigh. It's now turned into blue shingles, fluorescent blue shingles crawling up her thigh. I don't like the looks of it. I'm in bed with the covers over my head, I'm telling you. I'm, I'm frightened and I don't know why. Now, the following day after Thanksgiving, we have one day off in the city before we fly. And I have all these invitations to go to see various screenings of films. Because of Swimming to Cambodia, I'm suddenly getting invitations. And I have an invitation to see Cher's new film, Moonstruck, which is being screened at the Museum of Modern Art. And I think, well, sure, I'll give it a try. Why not? It's free. <laughs> and I get up there. I'm supposed to meet Renee there. It's a very cold day. Renee's cold, so she's waiting for me. She goes across the street to warm up in the public library. She sees me. She comes out. She's walking toward me. She has that face. I don't like what I see. Ooh, something's happened, and I don't want to know about it. <laughs> Someone's had a heart attack. Uh, she's read a letter of mine she shouldn't have read. Something like that. She comes over, she puts her hand on my forehead and says, Spall, do you have a fever? A fever? No, I don't have a fever. What is it, Renee? Spit it out. What happened? She said, I, um, I walked into the library and there was this book there. It was open like it was waiting for me and it had color photos of all the rashes that you get when you have AIDS. And mine was there. I said, oh, I just, uh, uh, um, wait a minute. Uh, uh, um, what library? Uh, you, you're Renee, right? Uh, wait. Um, what are we doing here? Why do we, why do we come in denial? Um, oh, uh, no, l l let me go over this again. You, you went in the li what book, Renee? I don't know what you're talking Denial? I, 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 my, my feet began, I've never wanted to disappear from a place more in my life. My, my feet began to sweat. I was sweating so much I was leaving sponge marks on the sidewalk in front of the museum. My mouth went dry. I, my mouth was like cotton. I couldn't speak. I couldn't spit. And every time I tried to deny what Renee was telling me, I would begin to go... <laughs> I was barking. I was barking in front of the Museum of Modern Art. I was barking and pacing in front of the museum. And Renee said, Spall, Spall, try to calm down, please. Remember, it's she that has the rash. Let's, let's go inside and try to forget about it for a bit and see Moonstruck. And Renee is, Renee is absolutely able to lose herself in the movies. I'm not, but I go in and I try. And I'm sitting there looking at, 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 at the film, but I, I can't concentrate on it. Every time Cher, Cher comes on the screen, I don't see Cher. Instead, I see a projection of the face of that sleazy, sexy stage door Judy with the very questionable sex and drug habits that I went home with one night after a show a long time ago, but not long enough ago. And every time I see that face, I, I, I start going... <laughs> Renee said, Spall, stop it, stop it. You're barking in the Museum of Modern Art. People are staring at you. They're staring at you. In fact, Cher is staring at you. I turn around, and there Cher is. She's behind me, surrounded by an entourage of men with purple and orange hair. I think, why would she be staring at me? And I, I go back, and I'm looking at the screen, and I see the face of that sexy, sleazy Judy again. And now I'm growling like, ah, ah. And Renee says, Spall, stop it, please. McNeil Lair is behind you taking notes. I, I turn around, there he is. I don't know which one, but he's there. And he's taking notes. And what is amazing is that every time I, I, I see that I'm being looked at by a celebrity, I'm no longer afraid of death or dying, which is some weird. I haven't been able to analyze that one yet. And we get back to Los Angeles. We get back to Los Angeles, and the spider bite or whatever it is is pretty much disappeared. But the whole incident has triggered in me this off-the-wall, irrational AIDS hysteria in which now I am sure that I am carrying the virus and I'm about to explode any day like a disease bomb. And believe me, national public public radio was not helping at all that winter. Every night at five, all things considered, would play the new high, the new risk, uh, the, the new uh, risk groups. High risk was out. No, no, risk was in. The new risk group, and believe me, you would be amazed how many of us in this room fit into that group. I certainly did. I did. And, and the Christian scientist in me was saying, uh, you know, simply don't turn the radio on at five o'clock. Don't turn it on. Because in Christian science, to name the disease is to get it, to absolutely get it. But the Freudian in me was saying, turn it on, turn it on. Because to name it is to claim it. To name it is to take away its power. So instead of going, Freud, Christian science. Freud, Christian science. 
uncircumcised males, 50% chance. HIV positive female. And I'm pacing around the table, and, and, and I'm sweating, and, and, and I'm barking, and, and, and my mouth is dry, and, 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 I, and I've got the book open, and I know, and it's there, it's there. I know what I have to write. It's right there. It's not something I have to make up. It's a memory, and all I have to sit down and do is sit down and write that memory. It's the summer of 1966, and I'm there, home with my mother, trying to help her through that nervous breakdown. And she is there that summer day, I remember tearing her hair, tearing it out, and singing uh, certain Christian science hymns out of tune and crying out to Jesus. And I'm trying to calm her down by reading to her from Alan Watts's book, Psychotherapy, East and West. Laboring under that romantic R.D. Lang idea that everyone who has a nervous breakdown is so lucky because <laughs> they get to come out the other side with such great wisdom, provided they come out the other side. And I was trying to help my mother through to the other side, but she wasn't listening to me. She was reading from Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health and also from the Christian Science Monitor. And there, I remember that warm July day, she curled up on the couch in her pajamas with the Christian Science Monitor between us like a Japanese paper wall. And I was so annoyed that I couldn't get through that paper to her that I just reached down and flicked it like this. And she pulled the paper down and looked me right in the eyes and said, how shall I do it, dear? How shall I do it? Shall I do it in the garage with the car? And I'm sitting there at that table with the book open and that California sun coming across me, lighting up every spot, every imperfection, every crevice, every... Renee, Renee, look, come here a minute. Would you come in bring the magnifying glass? This is not, it's not a freckle. I know this time. Is this a blue? Now that you're in here, look at the back of my tongue. Uh, it's white. I got the white back. Well, look all the way in the back. Look, but these are cheekbones, aren't they? Did I, do, am I losing weight? It's a skull, isn't it? Now tell me, I did not have cheekbones yesterday. She says, Paul, I can't do it. I cannot do this. I cannot write a film script and nurse you at the same time. You've either got to shut up or go get tested. I said, Renee, I, d I don't want to get tested for AIDS, really. I, d I don't want to know if I'm going to die. I'd rather not. All right? If you don't want to get tested for AIDS, then let's deal with the flying saucers. <laughs> Make a list. You have too many things. Get your priorities straight. Do you want to do this HBO flying saucer project? So we decide to research the flying saucers. And I have to tell you, this research did take my mind off death and dying for a bit. We go down to the Hollywood flatlands to a group called Skywatch which is basically a consciousness-raising group for people who have just been taken aboard flying saucers. And uh, we get down there, and it's in the flatlands. It's a kind of Hollywood bungalow, a little fire in the fireplace, about 25 metal folding chairs. They're pretty filled. We all find our seats and sit down. Now, at the end of the living room, there are about six people who have just been taken aboard spaceships, and they are testifying for the first time, and they're very vulnerable. And they're getting up one at a time to talk about this. And I have to tell you that, in my opinion, these extraterrestrials are not imparting any great wisdom to these people. <laughs> Basically, they are harassing them. You know, they're, they're making fuzzy minds fuzzier. They're, um, they, they, they're, they're cutting behind their ears. They're hypnotizing them. They're giving them anal probes. I mean, one man stood up very depressed and said, I'm from La Jolla. And I used to watch a lot of TV before I was taken aboard the spaceship. Now I don't. Now I just watch little dots come through the keyhole of my living room door and make crazy, crazy patterns in the room. Renee leans into me and says, Spall, let's get out of here before what happened to them happens to us. Cross that off the list, alienate HBO, and Christmas is coming, Christmas is coming, Christmas is coming. And the only reason I knew Christmas was coming because I heard it on the radio. I never would have noticed it out there. And now all I can hear that Christmas is the T.S. Eliot line going over and over in my head. All the world's a hospital, and either you're a patient or you're a nurse. And I did not want to be a patient again this Christmas. I really wanted to help people needier than I. I thought that's what I should do, put everything aside. I thought you're too hypochondriacal because you're surrounding yourself with yourself get rid of it help people this Christmas and I thought keeping with the theme of suicide what I would do is apply to the Los Angeles suicide hotline and answer suicide calls for Christmas I thought well wouldn't it be better to actually try to prevent a suicide than not be able to write about not being able to prevent one so 
I send for the application and they send it up. It's six pages long. I fill it out and then they want me to go down for a long interview. And it's quite a long interview. It's an hour and a half and there are two people interviewing me. In the course of the interview, it comes up that they might want me to go to school for six weeks in order to learn how to answer these calls. I hear that word school and I just go, oh no, school, oh darn. But I wanted to answer suicide calls for Christmas. Mr. Gray, my colleague and I have both found it very interesting talking to you, and we both think that it would be wise for you to go into therapy. I walk out of there, my feet are sweating, my mouth is dry, I am barking, I get back. I mean, when the suicide hotline tells you to go into therapy, it's time! And I get back to the house, I say, Renee, they say, I should go into therapy. What are you, how am I going to find a time to find a therapist? I got to finish the book. The mother says, here's the mothers. I got to go tell President Reagan. Christmas is coming in kale, and I've got to interview the people on the stage. And Renee says, Paul, calm down, calm down, listen. One thing at a time. Do the interviews. You've found the people not involved in the film industry. Get them up on stage and interview them fine. And in the course of the interviews, ask them if they know of any good therapists in the Los Angeles area. <laughs> While you're at it, ask the audience. So I decide to do that, and I begin the interviews. I found 40 people that I assume are not involved in the film industry, and I'm going to get four of them up at night and interview each one of them for half an hour. The first person that I interview is the woman that I have up there, and in the course of the interview, it turns out that just two months ago, she happened to be picked up by a spaceship on, the, on Ventura Freeway. <laughs> She was driving west on the freeway, an hour later she was driving east. She could not remember that hour. She lost the hour from her life. She wanted it back. She had to be hypnotized, digressed, regressed. She had total recall of being picked up by the ship. It picked her van right up off the highway and held it there. Gave her a full tour, which she described vividly, of the terrariums, the solar panels, the little eyes on the creatures. Now, the audience was completely silent and listening. No one laughed. They, they, I mean, I, I was open to I, I mean, when I do these interviews, I'm not judgmental. I'm not like uh, Phil Donahue or uh, Geraldo or Morton Downey Jr. I am I'm open. I believe everything that's being I'm able to suspend the window of disbelief just for about two hours until I get home and then woo, open the beers and then the judgment flows. But when I'm out there, I'm open and I'm listening. Now, the next person to come up after her is a man that weighs about 375 pounds, and he claims that he's a walk-in. That's what he calls himself. He says that he's had an extraterrestrial walk into him and is living inside of him, and that's why he weighs so much, to protect it. And uh, what he does is drive up and down the California coast doing workshops in churches where this little extraterrestrial speaks through him, and then after the workshops, he goes to Friendly's and has 15 milkshakes to stay fat to protect him. Now, after about two weeks of interviewing people like this, uh, I, I finish, I, I stagger off the stage. I've completed it. I think, thank God this is over with. I didn't find myself a therapist, but I did find 40 people not involved in the film industry, although they were all making their own private movies in their heads all the time. And I get off and I come into the dressing room and collapse in front of the mirror and think, whew. Now that's interesting. For two weeks now, I have not thought about death or dying once how therapeutic it is to surround yourself with people stranger than yourself. And no sooner do I think this than my feet begin to sweat, my mouth goes dry, I, I, I see my skull in the mirror, ah, I see the spots on my tongue, ah, oh no, and I hear this knock, I open the door, my savior walks in, a tall, smiling, balding man about 38 years old, hands me his card, it reads, Dr. Peter Lamston, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis? Oh my goodness, I don't think I have time for that. I was just looking for a therapist. He goes, Miss Balding, I think you do. I think you have time. I think your subconscious is so close to the surface, I can see its periscope. <laughs> Immediately, I liked him. I liked him, he had a wonderful sense of humor, and I thought anyone doing psychoanalysis in Los Angeles in this day and age must be very courageous. I mean, everyone's doing primal scream and birthing and getting it over within a weekend, and he's doing the classical Freudian talking cure. I'll give him a try. So we arranged to meet in his office. He's on the 24th floor in a skyscraper in Century City, one of the only skyscrapers in L.A., very New York, very Freudian. But in order to get there, 
in order to get to the 24th floor, you have to drive under the uh, 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 Century City uh, shopping mall. And I mean under and down. Underground parking, down, 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 down. Earthquake, 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 earthquake. <laughs> Park, run, 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 run to the elevator. Up, 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 pop out. And you get out, and you want to get your parking ticket validated or clipped so you can park for free. You have to have something done in the mall. I got a haircut that day. They clip my ticket. I go up to Dr. Peter's office. I walk in. Immediately, I like him. He's happy. He's smiling. He's a genuinely happy man. I think no matter what I say, I won't depress him. This makes me feel good. The other thing that I like about the setup is this office. It's most interesting. Uh, 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 it's divided in the most interesting way. Over here is, uh, well, I call it the Freudian side. It had a leather couch, two black leather chairs, and three boxes of pink Kleenex. Then, dividing the office in half was a tropical fish tank the size of this table with everything in all the fish, the pearl garomis, the angelfish, the fighting fish, the black mollies, little bubbles coming out of the diver's helmet. You could free associate on those for hours. On the other side of this uh, tropical fish tank, in the office, dividing the office, the other part of the office is what looks like a children's playground. I mean, I assumed it was for children. I certainly was gravitating toward it. Um, it had a little... A little sandbox, a little um, a low table, and easel, and toys. And, and so we begin working in the Freudian side. And he asks me, what's the problem? You know? And I tell him that I'm having this awful time finishing the book. I'm right in the middle. Every time I begin to write this one section, I, I feel like I'm disappearing or dying, particularly of AIDS. Really? Tell me, what are the symptoms, Paul? Well, um, uh, my feet are sweating in a, in a major way. I mean, big sweat, big... Uh, I change my socks three times a day. My mouth is dry, dry, dry. I couldn't spit if you, if you asked me to. And, um... Um... Uh, well, I, 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 I'm barking. <laughs> Not a lot, but maybe 15 times in the past two weeks. Well, Spalding, I really don't think we could call those symptoms. I, I'd like for you to tell me what's going on in that book of yours. Hmm? Because I'll bet whatever it is you're trying to write about is what's causing you to be upset. Could you tell me about the book? And I begin to tell him about the book, and we both realize that the book is so big that it's going to take three sessions a week. So, that's what I'm coming to him. I'm coming to classical psychoanalysis, three sessions a week. Although I have to say, the price was right. He really lowered the price, and uh, I have the health insurance, don't forget. So uh, at the end of the first session, I, I get out my check, and I don't have a pen to sign it. Here I am, a writer without a pen. He's a psychoanalyst without a pen. So he takes me over into the children's section, and he gets me down at the kids' table, a little table like this. And I'm down there waiting for him. And he comes over with a box of crayons and says, choose your color. I take out a, a magenta crayon to sign my check. I'm down there like this, signing my check, looking up at Dr. Peter, towering over me, thinking, this is the right relationship. So I'm coming to him three days a week and driving down, 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 under, parking, coming up, 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 and the elevator jump out. I want to validate my parking ticket, get it stamped. I can't get a haircut three days a week. It's just not growing in fast enough. So what I do... I go to the stationery store and find the cheapest thing I can buy. It's a pilot pen for 99 cents. But immediately I take the pilot pen and zip it in my Danish school bag because I don't want Dr. Peter to see it because I like signing my checks so much with different colored crayons each time. So, I can tell how many times I've been in therapy by how many pilot pens I have in my Danish school bag. It's bulging. Now, we're working. We're working very fast, and I'm very careful. You know, I'm not sure that I want to be cured by psychoanalysis because I, I think I know what the cure is, and I'm not sure that I want it, you understand? I, I mean, I'm looking both ways to make sure it doesn't take me by surprise. I know the cure is supposed to be the transformation of hysterical misery into common unhappiness. And God knows I have a lot of hysterical misery. Right? So uh, in, in the course of working with Dr. Peter, something happens outside this, uh, the uh, uh, psychoanalytic relationship uh, that almost cures me, gets my feet to stop sweating. Um, Renee and I get invited to bring our film, Swimming to Cambodia, to Russia, to Moscow, and to Leningrad, to the first Russian film festival. And I am very excited. I mean, I, I, this gives me such a sense of self-esteem that my, my feet pretty much stop sweating. I mean, they've invited, they've invited Rumblefish, Cool Hand Luke, Children of a Lesser God, The Empire Strikes Back, Officer and a Gentleman, The Wizard of Oz, Splash, and Swimming to Cambodia. I didn't ask.
but I, I wanted to go. Now, I was very worried that, that you know, the, the, the flight and the trip there and Russia and everything would be too much for me, and I, you know, I didn't want to end up in a Russian insane asylum. The last thing I wanted to do is start <laughs> barking in the streets of Moscow. So I thought, I will go if Dr. Peter says it's all right for me to go. So I go to them and I tell him about this invitation. He said, this is wonderful, Spalding, wonderful. I think that's good news, and I think you're doing very well. I've noticed your feet have dried up, and uh, also noticed that you're able to relate to me in a non-performance mode. But I, I, I want to warn you. You know, Russia is a very, very depressing place, particularly this time of year in February. In February, the sun never shines. I said, great, I'm going! And we arrive in Moscow and we're staying in the Soviet Skaya Hotel with these great marble columns and red carpet. It's like Eloise goes to Moscow. And I'm up there in bed in my Chinese long silk underwear, six wool blankets piled on top of me at last. I'm like a kid bunking school. Oh, snuggle, snuggle, snuggle. I jump up, I run to the window, I open the great curtains, open the blinds, open the shutters. I look out and Renee goes, what do you see, hon? I go, nothing, nothing, nothing. gray white snow coming down to meet gray white snow on the horizon fur balls scurrying Brrr, nothing no color i close the great curtains close the blinds close the shutters go back in bed and snuggle oh i'm lying there i'm talking to the chandelier renee says she was there in 1969 and all her lamps were bugged i'm telling the chandelier what i want for breakfast then it's time to turn on the television and watch russian morning news it's called 120 minutes Basically what it is is two Russians, a man and a woman, reading on camera from that morning's newspaper. And close-ups of paragraphs. <laughs> then it's time to go down for breakfast and it's old food. Oh, the food is old. It's old eggs cooked 30 seconds in coffee with no caffeine in it. And I don't mean decaf, I mean no caffeine. I mean, yet caffeine. It's all been removed and taken to hospitals for medicinal purposes only. <clears throat> Renee and I found out that that was going to happen before we came over, so we brought a pound of Nicaraguan coffee with us. And not being socialists, we were brewing it alone up in the room. I had a little coil, you know, heating it up, boiling it, pouring it through. We were the only ones in our entire group to come down in the morning. Awake, good morning. We love Russia. All the other actors are coming down with their sleep masks on their foreheads, going like this, coffee, coffee. This is a doctor ordered. Oh, looks like Turkish coffee. Oh, I don't know. Can't seem to get a buzz from it. I'll take another. I I don't know why I'm keep fat I can't. I've never tasted anything like this before. I don't know why I can't take it. You know, I'm just like... <laughs> now, the first thing that I discover, or that I find lacking in Russia, was no vodka. I, I was amazed. I'd expect to be drinking... I mean, that's part of why I went, to taste the different vodkas. Evidently, prohibition was on, yet the word was never spoken. No one said anything about prohibition. Yet you'd go into the hottest writers' club or bar, and writers and actors would all be there passionately slurping down Diet Pepsi and eating old locks. But no vodka. And no one would be talking about the absence of it. You'd never hear anyone say, when will the vodka come again? <laughs> or do you remember the vodka? No, nothing. And yet they were passionate. They were as passionate as if they were drunk. I mean, I had always thought that the, the Russians were passionate because of the vodka. It's not true. It's genetic. I'm passionate because of the vodka, and I wanted it. And I, I called my translator over, Misha, Misha, uh, who looked like a kind of demented version of Robin Williams on Moscow on the Hudson. I said, Misha, come here, come here. Tell me, what, where's the vodka? Why isn't there any vodka in Russia? He just goes, one day, no vodka. <laughs> So I desperately wanted to fill up my little bottles. I carried these around. I was carrying these little Smirnoff bottles around. I had four of them, and they start full, and then they get empty. And in fact, uh, I've been carrying these around with me since 1967, uh, when I first started drinking under the table in New York City, just <clears throat> pouring drinks under the table and, and saving money that way. Uh, really, um, I never got caught, and, and from the highest restaurant to the lowest, really, from the Rainbow Room to Burger King. Never got caught. Um, in fact, I saved enough money to buy a Soho loft pouring drinks under the table. 
and get you four bottles or two bottles if you want to start with two or even start with one and uh, get it out in the morning and get your big half gallon and uh, get a white plastic funnel from Woolworths for 59 cents and go down, fill up your bottles in the morning like that. You're all set, Captain. Ladies, you can put four in your pocketbook. Uh, guys, you can put two in either side pocket and you're off to your busy day in your fancy restaurant at night. Now, what happens in any American restaurant as soon as you arrive, what do they give you? Ice water. Lots of ice. And you have a perfect setup there. And all you have to do is drink the water down and leave the ice. And then everything's set to get the vodka bottle out under the table. Provided that is, you can keep the water boy away from the table. No! No more water! No, no more, no. no, no just leave the ice. I'm going to be working with it throughout the evening. Thank you very much. Then you have to get the bottle out. Now, to make sure no one notices what you're doing, you have to begin to talk very passionately with the person across from you. You have to make something up. This is a difficult part for me. Oh, I don't know. You make up something really important, like, say, talk about a film script or an affair, right? And you go, uh, oh, no. No, sir. No. I know they were married then, because I happened to be... No, I was at, I was at the wedding. And she did. She did not. That's crazy. <laughs> Never got caught, never got caught, never got caught. So I say to Renee, please, Renee, call room service and get some vodka sent up here. She says, Paul, there's no room service in Moscow. I said, well, call the, whole, call the kitchen. So she calls the kitchen, speaks enough Ru Russian to get a pint of ice cold Russian vodka sent up, a pint for 60 American dollars. And I'm content, I fill up my four bottles and we're off to the opening night ceremonies for the film festival. And I'm relaxed, and I'm sitting there pouring my fourth bottle under the table, eating old lox and old caviar. The waiters are coming and going, singing, yo, 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 And I hear this waiter behind me all of a sudden say, I saw that, comrade. What? Busted in Moscow for Smirnoffs? He takes it away from me. He keeps it as a souvenir. But I'm completely relaxed now. I am four vodkas to the wind, and everything's going fine, and the film is being received very well in Moscow, and everything is great until we go to Leningrad, and everything changes. Suddenly, there's no translation. Just like that. We have no translation for our film. Now, you have to understand, all of the films that were sent over there, none of them had subtitles. It would be too expensive. What they had was a translation of the film sent over. Then uh, the, the Russians did their translation, and then one Russian read all the lines. Right? <laughs> they turned the film down low, and you heard one Russian reading all, all the lines over. If you can imagine, you know, Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. Right? <laughs> Children of a lesser god. <laughs> but swimming, swimming to Cambodia was the least of the problems, because it was just one man speaking. We had a wonderful translation, and it went very well in Moscow, but suddenly it's, it's, it's nowhere to be found, and no one can understand where it's gone to. And I'm telling the Russian Film Commission, we can't do it. I don't see how we can put it on here. And they're saying, um, we must uh, 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 bring him flowers. We, we shall uh, we, uh, uh, bring him caviar. Uh, we, will, we will fix this, and uh, we must uh, uh, find him vodka. We will put, we will get. So what happens? is that the night uh, of the screening, I arrive, because I think it's going to be a travesty, and I sit in with the audience, and what they're going to do is have a translator sit up there and watch the film. He's never seen it before. He's going to watch it and speak it as it goes. <laughs> they have no idea how fast I speak in this film. The film comes on, and you hear my voice very low, saying, in 1984, I met this incredible documentary filmmaker, Roland Joffe, a very intense man, a combination of Jesus, Zorro, and Rasputin. Heart of Jesus, body of Zorro, eyes of Rasputin. And you hear, New York, New York, Chip. <laughs> Misha, I, Misha, Misha, come here. What, what did he say? An interesting director you met one time. I said, I said, stop, stop it, please. Stop the film, please. People are walking out in droves. They're talking, uh, stamping. I, uh, please, I, I, uh, come back in. I want to get up and apologize. Misha, I'm going to get up and apologize. Misha says, do not go up there. They will throw fruits and vegetables at you. I said, Misha, I am going up. Excuse me, people, but this is, I want to say, come back in. This has been a very interesting, uh, uh, Misha, will you translate this, please? He's speaking Russian. I don't know what he's saying to them. Please, it's been a very interesting time, but it's been a very confusing 
thanksgiving time i heard if i was came up here you were going to throw fruits and vegetables at me and i i have to tell you i'm honored i don't know where you were going to find them and uh, once you did, why you would waste them on me. But I want to try to save the evening if we can. The translation has disappeared. I would like to, if we could, take some questions from the house. Um, I don't guarantee answers, but I do guarantee responses. Can, can we do that, please? Uh, so Misha passes out the three by five cards, and they begin these, writing out these formal questions and passing them up to me. And the first question that comes up to Misha to be translated reads, Why did Dustin Hoffman make Tootsie? I said, now, you're going to have to make these questions a little more personal. Uh, the next question that comes up is, why are you so armored? Uh, you know, as in knight in shining armor or Rikian armor? Well, now, look, I never thought that I was armored. I mean, I, I certainly knew I was in New England, growing up in New England, but I thought since I'd come to New York City and done all my body rolls and psychophysical exercises that I'd lost my armor. And, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe they're picking up on something. Maybe they're uh, realizing that I've been sitting behind the table for 10 years doing monologues, and they're picking up on the kind of the table energy, you know? <laughs> because I am sitting down there with, with my translator, and, and I am sitting down, and I think the last thing that I wanted to do is appear to be armored in front of the Russians. So I thought, uh, maybe I should just get up and try to show the Russians my body. So I stand up. It's kind of a cabaret atmosphere. It's, uh, oh, they have a stand-up microphone right close by that I bring over. Um, Misha stands next to me. He's very nervous, never in front of a, an audience before. It's only done one-on-one -on -one translation. And I really wanted to get up and just, you know, do something physical for them. I would, if I could have, I would like to moonwalk right on, you know. But uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to moonwalk or maybe just put on some B.B. King music and done, it, done a few 60s body rolls like this, like the old times. But uh, there was no B.B. King music, so I, I talked instead and told the Russians a true story that happened to me while I was in Russia, in Leningrad, actually. I told them about how I was busted in the Hermitage Museum. Now, it was that particular morning we all voted to go on the bus to the Hermitage. We all arrived very excited and enthusiastic with our cameras around our necks. As soon as the museum guards see the cameras, they go, no, 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 no photo. Yet photo, please. No, no, photograph. No, yet. So, we all keep our cameras down. The only person that has a camera working is one of the actresses. She's got this video camera here every day. She turns it on in the morning, never lifts it higher than her knee. You know, never. And she's, she's videoing everything. Uh, I don't know what it is. It must be an experimental film of some sort, you know. Moscow from my left knee kind of situation. <laughs> so she's got it on. And we start through the museum. Now, whenever we go on one of these tours, whenever we go on one of these tours, we tend to fall into a V formation with whoever is, has the most popular film at the time is right up in front, you see, leading. It happened to be Richard Gere, right? We're going, ooh, we look like Canadian geese flying south, you know. Ooh, Richard Gere in the front, and then Daryl Hannah coming up in front of Molly Maitland, and Matt Dillon pulling up in front of uh, Carrie Fisher, and Ray, Renee Shafansky and I in the back, and we're going through the museum, and around the corner comes this other V formation of American high school students from Westchester, New York, and they all have their cameras around their necks, and they're, they're all coming, uh, going around the world on a school ship. They've stopped in Odessa and they've come down to see the museum. They round the corner in their V formation. They see our V formation. They go, holy <laughs> my God, it's Daryl Hannah. Woo! Oh my God. No, it's, it's Matt Dillon. It's Matt Dillon. Whoa! It's Richard Gere. Whoa! Flash, click, 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 flash, 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 click, 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 flash. The guards are running everywhere going, yet, no photo, no photo, no camera, stop, stop photo, stop photo. Why are Americans taking pictures of Americans? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over in the corner. I'm over in the corner because three students have recognized me. They've recognized me from being on the David Letterman show. And they're asking me, what is David Letterman really like? <laughs> and, and I want to tell them, but I'm too hot to talk, you see, because I have this Chinese long silk underwear on because it's so cold outside, but it's so warm in the museum. I'm steaming, and I'm just trying to get a little, a little relief. And I'm talking to them at the same time. I'm rolling it up and saying, David Letterman, he's all right. He treated me fine, you know. Treated me like a, whew, I don't know how to, I'm feeling cooler, though. I don't know. You know, David Letterman treated me like a downtown artist. You know, maybe if I'd been a woman, it'd been different. I don't know. who. I don't know. I don't care what I look like. All I know is I'm cool at last. I mean, I feel, I'm just standing there talking with him. I feel real relaxed. I feel like I must look like a bowery. 
Cory Baum or a kind of main clam digger or something. And all of a sudden, the museum guards, these great matrons, come and lift me up from under my arms and begin to throw me out of the hermitage. And I'm going, Misha, come quickly, translate. Why are they throwing me out of the hermitage? Quickly, come translate. Misha comes over and translates and says, for imitating royalty. <laughs> I tell this to the Russian audience, and they say, this could be true. We get back to New York City. We get back to Manhattan, that island off the coast of America. And I am so happy. I am so happy to be back. I'm cured from all that Russian common unhappiness. I mean, I am so happy that I bow down, kiss the monster. I really want to finish it now. I'm really raring to go, and I'm almost done. The character has made it almost to Bali. He's made it to Sydney, Australia, and he's on Bondi Beach. He's trapped there for a while, though. We can't quite make it to Bali because the two Australian airlines have struck. Qantas and ANSEC, and he won't fly on the Balinese airline, Garuda, because he won't fly on any airline where the pilots believe in reincarnation. <laughs> so he's trapped there on the beach. And I mean trapped, he can't even go in swimming, because for two weeks now he's been eating a fish called filet, and he finds out that's an Australian euphemism for shark. And now he won't go in the water because he thinks the brothers and the sisters are going to take revenge. So he's trapped on the beach, and he's surrounded by these beautiful, bare-breasted Australian women, and he can't approach them. You know, he doesn't go near them because he's on a mission, trying to get to Bali. He's trying to be loyal to his girlfriend, Cleo. And he also is, you know, don't forget, traveling with his mother's money. So he tries to keep his libido down, lying on that beach. You can't keep that stuff down. He gets back to the hotel, and it begins to rise up again, and he tries to exercise it by, by this ornate masturbation rituals in which he shaves all of his pubic hair to get in touch with some younger version of himself. <laughs> he's right-handed. He's working a lot with his left hand to surprise himself. <laughs> he's having a wild time with a Hoover vacuum cleaner, except the mode is so distracting, he wraps a blanket around it, puts it in the closet, and runs the hose out under the door. And I've just brought this section into my typist, who's a spinster from Queens, <laughs> and, and lives with her sister on West 48th Street. Now, she's the only one to have read the book. And every time I go in to pick up the typing, I look at her just to think, you know, it's, see, it's, it, does she think I'm a writer? And she gives me no feedback. She's completely professional. She sees me. She gets up. She moves like a great tortoise to her kitchen table, lights a Virginia Slim, hands me my bill. I sign a check with a pilot pen, hand it to her. This time I come in to pick up this writing. She sees me. She gets up. She moves like the great tortoise, sits at the kitchen table, lights the Virginia Slim. This time she turns to me and says, Well, Mr. Gray, you're definitely a writer. But I hope this is fiction. Or you're in real trouble. She judged me. She threw me out of the Garden of Eden. Suddenly I look back at the book and think, Oh, no, really? Is that what it is? If I've been working on this horror for three years with the earth, the earth coming to an end, with the ozone layer ripping, with the people killing each other, with the, with the tropical rainforest disappearing at a football field a second, and I'm working on this solipsistic, narcissistic, self-indulgent pile of poop, why, the most noble thing I could do is take it up to the Brooklyn Bridge and toss it off at dawn. But I had to finish it first. I had to finish it. I had to finish it before I could judge it and get through it, and I was almost done. I was burning to finish it, and I was writing. I should have unplugged the phone. The telephone rang. It was Gregory Moshe from Lincoln Center, director of Lincoln Center, saying, Hi, Spalding. Gregory here. Listen, how would you like to be the stage manager in Thornton Wilder's Our Town on Broadway? How would you like to be the stage manager of the 80s? How would you like to play the lead in Our Town? Gregory? That's really nice of you to think of me. I, I really would love to do it, but I have to tell you, I can't, I have to finish this book. Write it in the morning. 
We'll rehearse in the afternoon. It's a limited run. I know you can do it. I said, Gregory, uh, it's not just the book, actually. I love our town. I love the play. But I don't think I could say those words. They're so wholesome. I mean, it would make my skin crawl. Get Garrison Keillor. We don't want Garrison Keillor. We want you. We want your dark New England sensibility, your dark ironic. This is the end of the farewell to all sentimental our towns, the end of the hallmark card of our towns. We want your dark sensibility. We want you. I said, um, well, I tell you what, just give me a day to think about it. So I hang up, and I, I think, well, this is, this is great. This is, uh, this is incredible. I mean, I, I could work on my book in, in, in the dressing room, and um, it, it's a limited run. I could use my New England accent, which I've really never gotten rid of. And in this role, I could speak from my heart, you know, provided I could memorize the lines. And uh, I think I'll just call my Hollywood agent and see what she thinks before I say yes or no. So I call her, and she goes, Dear heart, dear heart, no way. Why, after all these years of acting, would you want to be a stage manager? <laughs> so I say yes, and da 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 trumpets blow. And the New York Times announces in the Friday section, at last we found a stage manager for the 80s. And I can't wait to get to rehearsal. I love the cast. I jump up. I run down to the Canal Street subway station. I run past the guy sucking the tokens out of the turnstile. I ride up in the subway. I jump out. I jump over the exploding water mains, make my way through the popping gas lines, step over the homeless, and make my way over the crack dealers on the back steps of the Lyceum Theater. And I'm in Grovis Corners, New Hampshire. What an oasis. People are coming and going, singing in period costumes. La, 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 la. In opening night is a to-die evening. It is so beautiful. I'm telling you, the cemetery scene that night is so beautiful that I am crying as I close the stage, stage manager, as I close the curtain. I'm weeping. I'm not acting. I'm, I'm crying. And it's a standing ovation. And everyone is off. We're off to Sardi's for the big opening night party. Of course, I can't help thinking and fantasizing as I go what the press will write about the show and about me. You know, this, uh, this once traditional actor who deserted us to go underground has returned and graced us with his ingenious interpretation of thought while the stage manager in our town on Broadway kind of thing like that. And I can so excited about what the critics are going to say. I can't sleep at night and I, I jump up and run out in the morning and buy all the papers and, and dump them in Renee's lap and say, Renee, just read the good parts. I'm going in and brush my teeth. Just yell out a few good lines. I'll read the rest later. I go in and I'm brushing my teeth and she's like, Renee, Renee, just read out a line, any line, go ahead. Renee. Oh, Spall. Oh, my God. Oh, this is... No, oh, let me look at the post. Oh! Oh, let me look at the Times. Oh! All the critics agreed. All the critics agreed. They wanted to tar and feather me and run me out of town. I had destroyed Thornton Wilder. The Daily News said, This just goes to prove avant-garde actors can't act. Spalding Gray couldn't even maintain a New England accent. <laughs> Edith Oliver of The New Yorker, good old Edith, I had to get out a dictionary to understand her review. Edith's review read, Spalding Gray's deportment was a blight to the town. I pictured myself like walking Dutch elm disease coming down Main Street. <laughs> but Clive Barnes of The Post said it all. Clive Barnes said, Spalding Gray came from outer space and Gregory Mosier left him there. <laughs> so I come in the following night, a broken man. I come in, the whole cast is whistling, singing, you know, I come in down, they say, what's wrong, Spald? I go, you know what's wrong, you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to uh, make me up, I really, I just, uh, you, you saw the reviews, right? No, we didn't read the reviews. Actors never read their reviews. Kidding, you didn't read the reviews? No, you, why empower those? If you're going to read the reviews, read them after the run, not during it. I mean, what, what if a critic says something about you and, and do you never be able to get that critic's voice out of your head when you come to that line? You'll never be able to say that line fresh again. Oh, how that happened. Oh, how that did happen to me. Frank Rich, critic for the New York Times, said that I was snide, flip, and condescending to the audience, as well as to the people in the town. 
and, and I know that I wasn't. But Frank Rich wrote it in the New York Times. Therefore, I must have been. So I, and he says that I did it in one line. He picked out the line right at the beginning of the play. A simple line. It reads, nice town, know what I mean? Question mark. So I come in the following night after the reviews, come out on the stage. I tell you, I have to tell you, I expected the audience to throw fruits and vegetables at me. And I walk out. Now, if you know the play, our town, if you don't, its uh, stage is completely empty. And I come out as the stage manager and have to describe Grover's Corners and describe all the shops and churches. And you have to imagine them as I describe them. And believe me, Grover's Corners has every church in it except a, uh, a, a synagogue, a Christian science church, and a mosque. Um, and I say, um, this is the congregational church where George and Emily, the young couple in the play, first get married. Along here is Main Street. This is the soda fountain where George and Emily first fall in love. Over here, George's house. George's father is the town doctor, Doc Gibbs. Right next door, Emily's house. This is Emily's mother's garden, the same as Mrs. Gibbs's, only a lot of sunflowers, too. And right here is a big butternut tree. Nice town. Know what I mean? But, but I, I loved doing the play, actually. I did. I, I was able to get in touch with Thornton Wilder's language, which helped me transcend anything the critics said, and swept me away back to New England, where I had originally come from, where I once believed in God and eternity and all the things that the play talked about before I moved to New York City and became a hardcore Freudian existentialist. <laughs> and particularly the cemetery scene. You see, Emily dies in childbirth, and they have her funeral on stage in the last act. And I had never been to a funeral before in my life. I'd even missed my mother's funeral because I was trying to take a vacation in Mexico when all of that happened. And now I'm going to a funeral eight shows a week, Emily's. And, and uh, strangely enough, this event is giving me a, a kind of closure around this whole issue with my mother and having missed her funeral. And uh, every night they, they would bring Emily on and bring her out in white, dressed in white. They would sing a hymn for her, and they, they would leave and cast her off, and, and she would walk across stage dressed in white and step into a straight-back chair, which represented her, her grave, surrounded by all the other recent dead, all in their straight-back chairs, sitting bolt upright, staring up at the stars above. And there they all were, fully concentrated. A li the little boy playing Emily's brother, Wally Webb, 11-year-old boy, is sitting there uh, for 40 minutes without blinking while I stand and talk about eternity and say things like, you know as well as I do that the dead don't stay interested in us living for very long. But they stay here until the earth part of them burns away, burns out. They're waiting. They're waiting for something they feel is coming, something important and great. Aren't they waiting for the eternal part of them to come out clear? And every night I would say that eight shows a week. And every night, basically, it would be the same. But often when you're doing a long run in the theater, often you have what I call a unifying accident in which something happens so strange on stage that it suddenly unifies the audience and the cast together in the realization that they are only here for this one moment together. It's not a film. It's not television. And because of the nature of the accident, we all know that it probably will never be repeated again in the same way. And somewhere in the middle of the run, that happened. I was talking about the dead, and I said, they're waiting. They're waiting for something they feel is coming, something important and great. And I turned to gesture to them waiting, and just as I turned, the little 11-year-old boy projectile vomits. <laughs> like a hydrant it comes, hitting one of the dead on the shoulder. The other dead levitate out of their seats in fear and drop back down. The little boy runs from the stage, vomit pouring from his mouth. Splatter, splatter, splatter. I am standing there on the stage. My knees are shaking. The chair is empty. The audience is thunderstruck. There isn't a sound except for one little 10-year-old boy in the eighth row. He he knows what he saw. 
He is laughing! <laughs> and I simply don't know what to do. I, I, don't, I don't know whether to go on with the next line as written and be loyal to Thornton Wilder or attempt what might be one of the most creative improvs in the history of American theater. <laughs> And then I decide at last to be loyal to Thornton Wilder and simply continue with the next line. And I turn to the empty chair and say, aren't they waiting for the eternal part of them to come out clear? <laughs> Then after three months, I finish the run of the play and I go upstairs to my dressing room to pack up the monster. I'd finished the book at last. It's 1986 and the character has at last made it to Bali. And he's lying there in a hammock looking up at the sky, remembering that first vacation he tried to take in Mexico and how when he came home, all that he found left of his mother was ashes in an urn, in a box, by his father's bed. And now lying there in the hammock, he's thinking, maybe he should try to write a short story about how he feels about all that. But looking up at the stars, he suddenly feels so present, so peaceful. He thinks, maybe he should forget about the story and try to take a vacation instead. Thank you for coming.